él es profesor de la Escuela de Educación de la Universidad de Harvard, es uno de los economistas de la educación más reconocidos, podrán ver la sonrisa de Francisco al estar aquí, eh, y además ha tenido contribuciones muy importantes eh, en diferentes etapas, ha investigado y respondido eh, preguntas muy relevantes en el campo de, de la educación. Como lo pudieron ver ayer, eh, presentó también esta, eh, resultados de esta investigación que han realizado para establecer una relación o resaltar las brechas que se asocian eh, en términos de ingresos y resultados educativos y por supuesto con este énfasis en desigualdad en particular para Estados Unidos. En el caso de México podrán, o a lo mejor lo habrán identificado, él hizo o dirigió el grupo que hizo la evaluación de impacto del programa Escuelas de Calidad, una de las primeras evaluaciones de impacto eh, que se hicieron en el país, obviamente eh, con una eh, complejidad metodológica muy alta que pudo resolver. Entonces, independientemente de eso, ayer les decía, además, eh, si, me, si alguien me pidiera algún día una definición de un buen maestro, eh, señalaría a Richard. Es una persona que se ha preocupado mucho por formar, por conocer, por acompañar, y justo por eso, incluso esta reunión fue una petición de Richard, quiero conocer a tus alumnos, quiero platicar con tus profesores, precisamente por esta vocación de educador que él tiene. Entonces, muchas gracias Richard por estar aquí, y comenzaríamos la, la presentación ahora. Thank you very much, Sergio. Uh, let me begin by apologizing that I need to give this talk in English rather than in Spanish. I, I can't tell you how many Spanish classes I have taken. <laughs> I have taken the class on the subjunctive three times. Uh, I am somewhat better. I can get food, I can get housing, but I can't talk about it technical work, but uh, I, that is a limitation on my part, for, for which I apologize. Uh, I see this as more informal than the talk that I gave yesterday, and uh, I'm used to giving talks in, to groups of economists, in particular at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and the tradition in economics, and particularly at the NBER, is that the speaker is interrupted all the time, very frequently. Uh, I like that. That's, uh, so I hope uh, I can encourage at least some of you to interrupt me with questions or comments. Uh, I know that may be less the culture here. But to facilitate this, I'm going to stop at least three or four times and ask you a question. I'll ask you to talk with somebody nearby about the question. Then I'm going to ask for volunteers to answer the question. Now, unlike yesterday, which was all about substance, uh, some of the talk here is about how you answer this research question. It's about methodology. And uh, as Sergio mentioned, uh, uh, I have an interest in working with members of the CREFAL team in addressing the same question with data from Mexico. So a key question is, you know, how do we do this work? Now this is pure descriptive work. It is not causal work. It's not saying, for example, where the class size affects how much children learn. This is simply what are the descriptive patterns. And from listening yesterday, I got the sense that there's a real need for Crayfile to support and develop descriptive work in a number of areas. Because it's important to have a thorough understanding of descriptive patterns as a first step And then, from when you understand the descriptive patterns, there are often uh, puzzles that, or questions that come up that lend themselves to causal analysis. Does a particular program make a difference? But that needs to be preceded by good descriptive work. And this is work that I've done in the United States with uh, a friend, uh, Sean Reardon. Sean Reardon is uh, a professor of sociology at Stanford University. Um, and 
I learned he's I learned a great deal from working with him. We know different things, and this was a lot of fun to to work with him on the project that took about three years. So the talk has five parts. Uh, what is the 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 igenesis, and what was the why did we do this? That's the first topic. The second is why it might be useful to replicate the analysis with data from Mexico. Third is, how do you do this work? Now, because we had to kind of figure this out as we went along. Uh, Sean had done work <coughs> somewhat similar that we took advantage of. You know, so fourth, what did we learn? And fifth, what, does the, what, are, what are the findings mean? And what is potentially of interest to policy? Okay, so uh, when we start to think about goals for American education, uh, you know, we had uh, in providing children with skills they'll need to thrive in a changing economy, indeed a changing society, uh, promote intergenerational upward mobility, by that, I mean, while a child may grow up poor, the idea of upward mobility is she works hard, her children will not grow up poor. And the third is to impart common values, and we talked something about that yesterday. And my guess is the goals would be similar in Mexico, although perhaps somewhat different. Now, uh, an assumption that Sean and I make as in carrying out the source project is that diversity matters. That it's important that children go to school with children who have different backgrounds than their own. And one reason is that it's very difficult to build and sustain high quality education in schools that serve only children from low income families. And there are many reasons for this. It's, the work is very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. So there's real advantage in having students from a variety of family backgrounds, a variety of incomes to go to school together. And the second is, if schools are segregated by income, in other words, if all the students are poor, for example, that means students won't interact, won't have, won't talk with students who, are, who come from higher income backgrounds. Or if all of the children are from high income families, they won't interact with children from low income families. It's very hard to learn the importance of tolerance, the values of other groups, if you don't interact with them. So, so we would argue it's important that we have fun. So that led us to the question. Uh, we know from work that Sean and I and many other scholars have done over the last 10 years that family income inequality in the United States has increased substantially. It's very high compared to other OECD countries. In Mexico, it's a little bit higher even. There's even more inequality in family incomes in Mexico, according to World Bank figures, than there is in the United States. So we had if you heard me talk yesterday, the theme of that talk was that growing income inequality had reduced educational opportunities for children growing up in low-income families. And there were different mechanisms through which that took place. I was sitting beside Sean at a conference uh, four years ago, and I, I asked him, what do we know about whether growing income inequality, how that has affected who goes to private schools in the United States? 
Is it the case that the very wealthy, you know, who now have much more money than they did in the past, increasingly send their children to private schools? Well, he did not know the answer. You know, we did some homework and we learned that nobody knew the answer. And we said, that seems like it worth investigating. In fact, the question, so the question is, did growth in income inequality affect who goes to private schools and whether that affected the degree of diversity in particular schools? In other words, did it increase or decrease the extent to which children from poor backgrounds had opportunities to go to school with children from background from families that had more money. So that was the question. And we got some funding from a foundation and set out to try and answer that question. Now, the answer is not obvious to my mind. One reason is in the U.S. tax structure, if you, every family wants the best education for their children. If you have enough money to buy housing, and if, if, you have, if you have a substantial amount of money to take care of your children, you can do one of two things to, to help them to get a good education. One thing you can do is move to a community that has very good schools. Now, housing in communities with very good schools tends to be expensive. The other thing you can do is send your child to an expensive, high quality private school. Now, there is, the way the tax system works in the United States, there's an advantage in doing the first thing. That is, in moving to a community that has high housing prices and good schools. Why? Because the interest you pay on your mortgage is tax deductible. So it's a big tax saving. On the other hand, the tuition you pay for a private school is not tax deductible. So it's not obvious what the answer would be. But we thought, well, there are at least two groups for whom growing income inequality might have a particularly large impact on families' choices about whether to use private schools. One is families that choose to live in big cities. Why? Because unfortunately, in the United States, there are no big cities that have high quality public school systems. In all big cities, almost all, the, 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 most students are very poor, and it's very difficult to provide high quality education. So we thought it might be that increases in family income inequality might particularly affect the choices families who live in cities make. We also thought it might affect choices of families living in the South. Why the South and not in the North? Well, in the North, most big cities have many, many communities around them that have their own school systems. I live in, in, in the Boston area. There are 40, you can choose at least 40 different communities within 15 miles of Boston, which will have its own school system. So it's very easy to move to a different neighborhood, keep your job in Boston, but have your children go to a different, and hopefully better school. In the South, school districts are very big. They're contiguous, they're the same as counties. So it's very, it's more difficult to choose a community that has high quality schooling without moving a long way, which most families are not willing to do. So we thought it might be that growing income inequality would have more impact on family schooling choices in the South than in the rest of the country. Okay. Now, 
this is kind of a surprise to many Americans. These are the percentage of children. The red line are secondary school students. The blue line are primary school, elementary school students. The percentage that, of children who go to private schools, that is, non-public schools. And we see it's declined substantially since 1960. In 2013, the last year for which we had data when we were making this graph, we saw that about uh, About, uh, right, okay, so about 9% of elementary school students went to private schools, and about 7% of <coughs> secondary school students went to private schools. But we're particularly interested in how about the family incomes? of the children, has that changed? Family income to children who go to private schools. Now, what would these numbers look like in Mexico? So keep in mind, so this is nine and this is seven. Right, in Mexico, about, so the percentage of younger children in lower secondary who go to private schools is nine percent just about the same as in the United States. But when you go to upper secondary school students, it's more than twice as high. So almost 20%, almost one in five Mexican children who are in upper secondary school go to private schools. So this means, this might be particularly interesting to examine this question about who are they? Are they students from relatively affluent families, or are they just as many students from low-income families who attend private schools in Mexico? Is the answer any different in Michoacan than it is in Mexico City? Would be an interesting question to know the answer to. Okay. So, how do we do this work? Well, the big challenge of getting data. And we're going to meet later today to talk about data in Mexico. Uh, there's no, what would you really like to have? If you could have all the data you wanted, you'd like to have information on family incomes for a large sample of Americans. And you'd like to know the ages of their children, whether they were in school, whether they went to private schools or public schools. And you like this for every year going back for perhaps half a century. Well, unfortunately, no such data exists. So what you have to do is piece the, the bring together a variety of different data sets and piece it together. So these are these are household surveys current population, often called CPS in the United States. They're administered every month to about 60,000 households, and they ask about family income. In the October current population survey, they ask about where your children go to school. So you can use the current population survey. The problem, one problem is, they don't tell you what kind of private schools. Now that's probably less of an issue in Mexico. My understanding, the vast majority of private schools in Mexico are Catholic. Does that sound right? Mm. I'm not sure. Not sure. Probably well, half half. We'll have to learn. <laughs> uh, well, see, that has changed in the United States. So it's really, if you want to understand a good descriptive understanding, you'd like to know are the kind of students who go to Catholic schools in terms of family income, are they different from the family income of children who go to what we might call uh, non-religious schools? Okay, so what do you, how, what do, you do? Well, 
these are just these are definitions. I think you probably all know those definitions. Just to be sure, we're clear. So the 10th percentile family income means that 10 percent of families have less money. 90 percent of families have more money. The 50th percentile, often the median income, means half have more, half have less. The 90th income percentile means that 90% of families have less, 10% have more. Okay. Now, what questions are asked in databases? Now, let me just go back a second. So we, we rely, in the work I did with Sean, primarily on these current population surveys. You have those in Mexico, you have, those are household surveys. They're asked to large samples, random samples of households. Uh, what's the, what is it called in, the, in Mexico, your household service? Any? Any. Any. And, and it's a, is it a random sample? Or is it a, it's a random sample? And how often is it administered? Two years. Every two years. Every two years. And it, now, I, I asked Sergio earlier, my understanding is, so the question is always, if you want to learn about family income, what question do you ask? One question you could ask would be, what is, was your family income in the last year? And families could give you a number. That's not what they do in the United States, and I don't think that's what they do in Mexico either. Instead, they give you a bunch of categories, and they say, your family, which category does your family income fit into? Those categories might be called bins. So here would be an example. So you've got the lowest bid. This is for the, uh, I think this is the 1987 household survey. So pay attention here because I'm going to ask you in a couple of minutes how you would actually use these data. So you can't just listen. So the lowest bin is less than $5,000. The next bin is at least $5,000 up to $7,499. The third bin, 7,500, it's 9,999. Goes all the way down. The next to highest bin is 100,000 to 149,000. The highest bin is at least 150,000. So they don't distinguish between, they don't have any bins higher than this. So there were, in the 1987, I think it is, how, whole survey, there are 14 bins. And if you just look at the data, I think this would be true in the Mexican sample as well. You can just count what percentage of the families that respond said their income was in each of these bins. So you'd add them all up and it'd be 100% of the families that you that you surveyed. So, for example, you might find when you look at the data that 2% of the family said their family income was in this bin. 6% said their family income was in this bin. 6% said their family was in the next bin. You might get all the way down here. This is the highest bin, the so-called top-coded bin meaning you don't have any, you won't know any, they only know it's more than 150, not how much more. And it might be that 8% are in this So how are you going to use that information? Well, one thing you can do is you can say, okay, what income percentile would a family income be in if it answered in a particular bid? And this is a tricky point. So for example, this is the lowest bin. 2% of families said 
their fair incomes are in that lowest bid. Okay. Let's take the midpoint of 2%. That would be what? So well, for any family who says his family income is in that lo lowest bid, we'll say they're in the first income percentile. So we'll, we'll have an income category between zero and 5,000. And we'll say that's the first percentile. Why first percentile? Because it's midway between zero and two. Now let's look at the second category. 6% said they were in that second bid. Well, if 6%, that means going from the bottom, it goes from 2% to 8%. Because the 2% were in the lowest bid. Another 6% were in the next highest bid. So between 2% and 8%. And what's the midpoint between 2 and 8? Be 5. So we'll say anybody who reports that their income is here in this bid will say their income is in the fifth percentile. Then let's go to the next bid 7,500 to 99. So let's say also we counted in those 6%. Well, that means they were between, so we had 2%, 6%, that added up to 8. And then we had another 6. So that goes from 8 to 14. Halfway in the middle of that's going to be 11. We're going to say that they're in the 11 percentile. So we can do this, then we'll get to the top, let's go to the top bin. The top bin, 150,000. 8% of families with children said they were in the top bid. Well, that 8% had to go from 92% up to 100%, because all families report income in one of these bins. So between 92 and 100, midway between is 96. Now, for reasons that aren't obvious, unless you remember, unless you've taken probability theory of statistics. Not only taken it, but remembered it. Uh, you, would, you would know that if, when you have a, when you have a binary, a, value, a variable that only take on two values, zero or one, and if you want to ask, uh, and you know the, uh, you can actually figure out what is the standard error associated with an estimate. And that's that's a little. So you basically you have, you have an estimate of how precise each of these numbers are. So notice again, we've got 14 categories. For each of these categories, we we can well we're gonna give an estimate of the what percentile it's gonna be. Then so we can plot those. And we'll have 14 data points. Each data point is going to be a particular income percentile. So it would look like that, where each data point is a dot. And the, 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 the whisker around the dot is your estimate of the standard error. So notice, if you counted those, you've got 14. Why 14? because there were 14 income categories. Now you might guess, what, so what are we going to do with these? So we have, notice what each of these is. What, going back, I, I missed really one point. So, you've got this is the family income. Now each of these families that was completed this survey was asked about their family income, which Bennett fell into. And they were also asked, did you have a child of elementary school age? And if so, 
did that child go to a private school or did that child go to a public school? So that means that, so for these 2% of families that answered in the lowest bid, say there's a thousand of them, each one would tell you, did you, did you, did you have a child who went to a private school? And let's say 3% said they went to private school. Then you'd have an ordered pair. You'd know the income percentile on average is first percent, and you get an estimate of 3% went to private school. So that gives you one of these, each one of those gives you a point. So let's look at this first point. This point, so. This is the lowest income bin. And of families in that lowest income bin, it looks as if about 2.5% of families reported they sent their child to a private school. Let's go to this income bin. This looks like just about median income. It's about the 50th percentile. And notice about, going over here, it looks like about 12% of those families reported that they sent their child to a private school. So before we move on, it's important that everybody understands this. I can, I can tell by the conversations, uh, uh, you know, some of you have less skill in English, undoubtedly more skill in English than I have in Spanish but it's a bit of a challenge. So before we go further, I'd like you to talk to somebody next to you about how, so we started with a household survey. And what we did to start, I didn't make this clear, is we only included in our study families that had a child in elementary school. So we've got to say, 10,000 families who, who we have information on. And for each of these, each of these families had at least one child in elementary school. And for each of these families, we know what income bin they're in. And we know, they've told us whether their child went to a public school or a private school. That's what we know for every one of the families in our data set. Remember, every one of the families we're studying had a child in elementary school. That's what we know. So if you had that information, how do you go from there to here? So I'd like you to spend a couple of minutes, two minutes, talking with somebody next to you about how you actually, how that's done. Then I'm gonna ask for volunteers to explain this to the group. And it's fine to explain it in Spanish. Uh, we have, uh, 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 we'll ask them for help in helping me to understand your Spanish if you'd rather speak in Spanish than English. So spend two minutes. Again, how did you do this? Oh, okay, let's, uh, let's see if we can do this together. <laughs> now, the, uh, uh, thanks to our Organia colleague, we have all pictures together. So let's so let's let's take as a first step, seeing if we can understand. Where this circle comes from, okay? Now that circle is, we just plotted that on a graph in which we have the, what's on the x-axis is income percentile. What's on the vertical axis is the percentage of children in that whose families are in that income category 
who attended a private school. Okay. So this data point right here looks like that's the so that's the ordered pair. As drawn, this looks like it's a it's about the ordered pair of one and about 2.5. One is the income percentile, 2.5 is the percentage of students whose families were in that lower income band who, who, who attended a private school. Is that okay? Are we clear? Are we clear then where this first data point came from? Okay. Now if we put we put over here, so we've got oh sure, of course. So how about questions first? Uh, questions about how we got this first first data point. We're just plotting these two numbers. It's one, it's one on the horizontal axis and 2.5 on the vertical axis. That gives us the coordinates of a point. Questions about that? Now, we got to then, how did we get this point? That's the next one. So, if we go over here then, and we say, we're going to put here, income bin, income category, and then we're going to put uh, percent in bin, and we'll put up here cumulative percent, and then we're going to put over here, Percent private school. All right. So we, our first income bid was less than five thousand dollars. The percent in the bid we said was two. So the cumulative percent. All right. Uh, so let's put one to you, one more category. Midpoint of income percentile. And we're going to put here cumulative income. <laughs> So we've got that's the first bin. We had percent in the bin was two. So the midpoint of that bin is going to be one. The cumulative percentage is going to be two. And we reported this was about 2.5. So is it clear where those numbers came from? Lowest bin, 2% of the respondents said their income was in that lowest bin. Let's take the midpoint of that 0 to 2, that would be 1. Since we're starting from the bottom, we've, we've got only 2% of the population so far. And of those thousand families or so that reported they were in that bin, uh, 25 of them reported they sent their child to private school. That is 2.5%. Okay. So what we're plotting here then is this is on the x-axis and this is on the y-axis. And that's this point. <coughs> now, we got to go to the next one. So we've got that. The second category is 5,000 
7499. And we said there are six percent in that bin. So that percent, six percent of the sample of families with an elementary school child reported that they had their income was between five thousand and seventy four ninety nine. And it looks over here, and of those families, about three, it looks like, about 3% said their children were in a private school. Now the question is, of course, how do we get here? So we had 2% in the bottom bin. We're adding another 6%. So in terms of what percent of the whole sample we've now included, that's going to go up to eight. Because we had two, then we've added another six. Two plus six is going to be eight. But what's the midpoint between the two and the eight? So here's what we're going to plot. Five on the x-axis, three on the y-axis. Okay. Now let's go to the next bit. 7,500 to 9,999. So, and the percentage there was six. And it looks like here, that's up to about 4%. Now, what's the number, what number goes here in the cumulative percent? Oh, I like that number. Who, who, who gave it a little louder? That was a good number. 14 is going to go here. All right, and can you explain in either English or Spanish, how did you get that 14? Because I think the first uh, two, and then plus uh, six, and then plus six. Plus six, okay. All right, and now, what number is going to go here? The middle between eight and 14. Which is? <laughs> so, in other words, we've got what's the number halfway between this and this, and that's going to be this. Number. So then now we're going to plot this on the x-axis and this on the y-axis. Let's add one more number. It's not on my chart, but let's, let's make another category. So this is going to be 10,000 to 19,900. And let's have this be So we've got a next category. Next category of income. 10,000 to 1999. And we found that 8% of our sample said their income was between 10,000 and 19,099. And then we, we then asked them, then we looked at the data and said, well, what percentage of your, your children are in private school? And it, was, and it was about 4.5%. All right, now, I want to know what number, what's the cumulative percent? Well, if somebody, somebody different, what's the cumulative percent? What, what are we going to have here? 22. Uh, I like that, nice and loud. 22. 22? How did you get this 22? How did you get the 22? 
We just added up. We had we had two plus six is eight plus six is fourteen plus eight is twenty-two. Now the question: What's the midpoint of that category? Eighteen. What's the eight? Uh, my arithmetic would be 18. Okay. How did we get that? Okay, we're, we're going to do one more, and I want you to be sure that you all talk to your neighbors about how you get this. This is going to be the next step. 20. Okay, next category is twenty thousand to twenty nine ninety nine and twelve percent twelve percent of the sample said they were between their income was between twenty and so I want to know I want to know what goes here and I want to know what goes here. So would you talk to your neighbors? Let's be sure everybody can figure that out. Just spend a couple of minutes. Everybody got this? Yes. Yeah. Everybody got this back here? <laughs> so I can ask anyone for those numbers now? Okay, all right. So let me ask, uh, ask you if I may. So what number, what number is going to go in the cumulative one? What's, oh, what's that? 34. 34. Right. Is that clear to everybody? Does anybody have a different number to go there than 34? Is it clear how we got to 34? Yes. What number goes in the circle, though? And let's let's be clear. Can can you tell us that? What number goes in the circle? Twenty-eight sounds awfully good. <laughs> okay, twenty-eight. And now we would just have to count and see what percentage of those families there who put their kids in high school, and that might very well be six. So if that was a six, we'd be plotting 28 and six. Now, we're going to do one more that's a little different. Uh, it's my head Where did you get the, those six? Which? The, the, that six? The six here? Yes. Uh, Where did you get Well, I made it up. But how it actually came from. Good question. So in the data set, remember you're going to have, you're going to have, let's say you had 10,000 families in your data set. And we saw that 12% of them, so that would be 1,200 families reported that they had income in this range. 1,200 families. Each of those families has a child in elementary school. Each of those families would have told you whether the child was in a private school or a public school. If we count, if we code it as one, that they're in private school, zero if they're in a public school, and we simply compute the average of those ones to zero, and I'm suggesting we get 6%, 0.06. Is that okay? That's a terrific question. Now, last one. 
Okay. Now, the last category, the top category, 150,000 or more. And we had 8% reported there in that top category. So I want to know what goes here and what goes here. What's the cumulative and what's going to go in the, in the average percentile. So again, that's the top category, the very top one. So spend, spend a couple of minutes. I want to know again, the top category, very top bit. We had 8% of families reported their, their income was 150,000 or more. Top category. So we want to know, okay, remember our whole game is we want to turn income into income percentile. That's what we're doing. So I want, this is the top category. So we got to know, figure out what goes here and what goes here. So let's spend, spend, a, spend a minute talking about that. Top category. Is it clear?
uh, four. So what's between the twenty? No, like, sorry, this between ninety-two and one hundred. If we count four places, it goes to ninety-six. That's right. That's just right. Very nice. Yeah. And, and as we expect, notice when we look over here at the top bin, this looks like it's about 28%. So what we're plotting is the 96% on this axis and the 28%. So, How are you, 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 you want to clear, is this hot? This, how about a follow-up question, in either language, at least, about what we're doing? So let's go back and think where we started, okay? We had, just like in the Mexican survey, you've got a large sample of Mexican Families. And let's identify, let's pick out the Mexican families in the survey that have a child in elementary school. And we're just going to work with them. Now let's say we had 10,000. And we'll know for each of those families, we'll know what income bin they said their income was in. And we know whether their child went to a private school or public school. That's the information we have. And we can follow that. So if we have 14 bids, we'll have 14 dots there. And if that's all, all we've worked on for the last half hour is just how we convert that basic information into the 14 dots. If we had 16 bins, we'd have 16 dots. If we had 12 bins, we'd have 12 dots. Okay. Now, as you might get, just, just when you look at this, this is what you've got. And if we forget about the bars, you've got, this, you've got, the, you've got uh, 14 dots. What might you think you'd do next? Well, they get those 14 dots. What might you, what might a six-year-old do with those 14 dots? I like that. Let's just, let's just connect them, right? Or, 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 that's what the six-year-old could do. Let's do it a little bit differently and say, let's find a, draw a curve that'll be simple, that'll go through most of the dots. And that's what, so what we're going to do. Oh, thank you. Give me back to, I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. So what we're going to do, that looks complicated. All that is, all that is, is it's effectively, that's an equation that describes a curve. We're going to just fit a curve through those points. Not, but we want it to be a smooth curve. When we do that, that's what we'll get. So that's a smooth curve that does a pretty good job of going through those points. <coughs> Is that okay? Now that curve, it turns out, just the mathematics of it is, uh, is, is effectively, it's just, fitting a function, because it's called a logic function, and you're just getting the estimates of the, if you remember back when you did high school algebra and you found the equation of the line, this is just very similar to that. So you've got a curve, and this is the curve that said, for 1987, this is where they did it, for that year, this is the relationship between family income percentile and the percentage of kids who went to private school. So notice, so what is the shape telling us in substance? 
I'm going to volunteer for that. The fact that this curve goes, shapes upward as we go from left to right. I'm going to volunteer, either language, telling us what that, what does that mean in English? The fact that the curve is not a horizontal line, that it goes from lower left to upper right. What, what is that telling us? What do you think that is telling us? Okay, please, nice and loud. Let's give you a mic if, uh, if we can find one. Oh, nice and loud. Um, possible that the relation is that uh, as more. Um, it was. Does it work? You may just try it, see if it'll work. Um, it, it shows. Oh. It shows like uh, more uh, income. Uh, it's more um, possibility that I enroll my children in a private school. That's right. The more money you got, the more the higher the probability you're going to enroll your child in a private school. And and it's the, the fact that it curves. Someone else here, the fact that it's not a straight line, that it curves up more steeply at the end. What is that telling us in, in simple, some of a different person? Notice it's not simply a straight upper line. It kind of gets kind of flat and then, oh, it got getting steep when we go up there. So what does, what does that, what's, what is that gonna tell us? Somebody else? Porque existe, mmm, bueno, la clase baja eh, tiene menor probabilidad de llevar a sus hijos a escuelas privadas. Sin embargo, la clase media tiene eh, en, como un promedio de hijos que van a, a escuelas privadas, por eso está en el sentido de la curva. Y los hijos de clase alta tienen mayor probabilidad de ir a una escuela privada. Y bueno, el sentido de, de la desviación estándar es porque existe menor probabilidad de los hijos de percentiles más bajos de tener acceso a las escuelas privadas, por eso es más estrecho, más corta la desviación, a diferencia de la clase alta. Thank you, thank you. So, I, 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 I think that's right. So, another way to say it is, to move from the 50th percentile to the 60th percentile. It's not going to change very much the probability you send your child to a private school, right? When we go from here to here, that's awful flat here. Uh, when we, however, and when we go from 60 to 70, that is a bit more, but not so much. But when we go from 80 to 90, it matters a whole lot. So having a little extra money matters a whole lot in predicting who goes to private schools at the, among the quite affluent. Right. So once we've fitted this curve, we're in a position then to say, OK, let's pick an income percentile like 10. We can just go right up the curve and we can predict what percentage of kids would go to private school. We can do it for any income percentile we want. And that's what we do next. So we take in the curve, we say, say if we need to summarize all this data somehow, make it easier. So let's, let's say we're particularly interested in low income families, 10th percentile. Meet it, families in the middle. Median income, 50th percentile. And families at the relatively high, 90th percentile. So we can, once we've fitted the curve, 
we can point off from the curve. So if a 10th percentile looks like two point, the percentage of kids you predict to go to private school is 0 0.0263. In other words, a little more than 2% are going to go to private school. The kids in the middle, families income in the middle, looks like it's a little less than 10%. For families at the 90th percentile, it's considerably higher. It's, it's 17 percent, almost one in five. Okay. So from all this work we've done so far, we've got an estimate of the percentage of kids who go to private school from low income, median income, and high income. We've got that for a particular year, depending on the year the data came from. So if we did this, we could do this for every year. And what we get is this. So the three points that we saw here, this point, this point, this point, are, are these three points. Notice we get down here and here. So we go through this whole exercise again and again and again, one time for each year, and we get three data points for each year. Then we're just going to fit curves through these data points. When we do that, that's what we're going to see. So, we've done all this work basically to get those pictures. Now, what do you learn from those pictures? What you learn is really three things. Kids who's low income, so this, this curve, the green curve is for low income families. This is for middle income families. And this is for high income families. And what you see is, among low income families, uh, not many kids went to private school, about one in 20, 5%. And that's remarkably stable over a long period from 1970 to 2013. When you look at middle income families, that's a different story. When you look at middle income families, that's a big decline. Big decline. Many, much lower, over time, the percentage of middle income families that went to private schools declined from about 12% down to about 6%. High income families, it's about the same. It was high and stayed high. <laughs> so basically what we see from this is, you know, is that from all this work, that private schools increasingly serve kids from high income families. All right, can we move on a little bit then? Now, in the United States, we have different kinds of private schools. There are at least three different kinds. There are Catholic schools. There are religious schools that are not Catholic. They may be connected to a Protestant denomination or other Jewish schools. And then we have school, private schools that are not connected to any religion. So the question of, that many Americans are interested in is, is the, does the pattern look like that for all the different kinds of religious schools? So what we're going to do is just redo this, but do it separately for each type of school. And the reason that's interesting is, so that's the same picture we saw before, is if you notice, so spend, spend one minute telling us what this pattern shows. What, that's a pure descriptive pattern. What do, we, what, do, what do you see in that pattern? One minute on that. Gracias. 
So uh, we have a we have a volunteer uh, to in Espanol. What what what's the what's the pattern here? So everybody, listen, please. De CAI a partir de los 60, 70, hay una, hay una caída hasta 1990, okay. eh, que se incrementa mucho más la participación de otras escuelas privadas de otras religiones y lo mismo lo que serían las laicas, ¿no? Pero principalmente que es una tendencia que cae de escuelas privadas católicas. Thank you. So there's been a big, big change, a big change in the mix of private schools in the United States. It used to be if a child went to a private elementary school, the child almost for sure went to a Catholic school. It, by the time, in recent years, that's much, much less true. In fact, notice in 1965, almost nine out of 10 children who were in a private elementary school were in a Catholic school. That's now only about four in every 10. And the, and the growth has been in these religious schools that are not Catholic, and in the non what we call non-sectarian schools. I gave a talk in Spain, and someone told me that word in Spanish has a very different meaning than it does in English. Uh, so I apologize. Uh, all this means is a, a school not affiliated with a religion. So, in fact, in the United States, the non the quote non-sectarian, these are the very expensive private schools. So a question would be, you know, we saw patterns like this. These were didn't these didn't distinguish the kind of private school. What if you now look and and make a pattern for each of the privates? What would you what each kind? What would you get? And that's what you get. So notice the blue line on top are high income. The red line is middle income. The green line is low income. Spend, spend a minute talking to your neighbors. How would you summarize the patterns? You can pick, up, pick out any of the three you want. You want to have three states, one for each country. What would you say is going on here? What has the trends been? in the types of families that attend each of these types of schools.
Now, just for a point, non-sectarian schools are much, much more expensive. Uh, for example, one of my colleagues, who just became our dean, uh, who's a wonderful woman, has two sons. They each are in uh, a non-sectarian private school in Cambridge called Buckingham, Brown, and Nicholas. The fee each year for each child is $40,000. It's an excellent school. Very small classes, superb teachers, great activities, but it's very, very expensive. So what is the pattern that you see in the data for the, remember, no religious affiliation for the non-sectarian schools, but very expensive. What's the pattern? I'm going to volunteer, either language, the pattern for the, that you see for the non sectarian. Okay. You know, I'm noticing the volunteers are all the women. <laughs> all the volunteers. Where are the males in here? How about you folks in the back? How about either language? How about the how about one of you for the non sectarian? For the non sectarian uh, what was the question? Whether the trend was <laughs> so uh, we see that from the 1970s um, to to the year 2013, um, they have been, the enrollment has been increasing, and uh, enrollment of high income, low income, middle income has increased at the same high, rate. High income. All of them have been increasing, but uh, you can see it is very steep for the high income group. So how about the percentage of families from the middle of the income distribution? What about what percentage of them go to private, go to non sectarian schools? Around 1.5. Very, very low. Right? Maybe, maybe, yeah, 1.5 is just right. Is it much higher uh, 40 years later? No. Now, even back in 1970, 90th percentile income families were more likely to go to non sectarian schools than were middle income families. But what has happened, continue on with your statement, with it, give some numbers on this percentage for the high income families. It was what in 1970? What in 2000? It was um, a little under 3% by 1970, and uh, recently it went all the way up to over 6%, so more than double. So it's a great growth. We saw in the previous, in the previous graph, we saw there are more children attending 
non-sectarian private schools in 2013 than there were in 1965, then we want to know, is it, has the growth been among families across the income distribution? And the answer, as you've explained, is no. It's overwhelming. There's no decline for any group, but the big growth is among children from affluent families. Okay, thank you. Now we're going to turn to the Catholics. That's a little more complicated. But we have a volunteer right over here who is going to do this for us very well. <laughs> then we're going to wait for the other religious, right? Um, definitely we see that all of them decrease, but we see that the middle income are the ones that are bigger, the difference, it's almost a half of it. And uh, also in the, half, in the lowest, it's kind of steep, but the biggest is the middle income, and it's almost a steady decrease in the high income. Right. So, in, in terms of the statement, ask this question, we know from the previous graph that there are a, a, a smaller percentage of the, uh, that fewer children are in Catholic schools today than there were 40 years ago. But then if we ask the question, are Catholic schools serving increasingly kids from low-income families, middle-income families, or high-income families, what, would, what do we see? Okay, continue. You're, you're doing fine. Um, we're seeing that from the 90s also to the 2010, this is like a big decrease in serving the Catholic schools in the to the middle income countries. That's uh, right. Schools. So this is uh, so increasingly Catholic schools they're serving fewer children. But those that are serving are increasingly from higher income families, which is a surprise to many Catholic educators. Now the most complicated and confusing pattern are these other religious. A lot of these other religious, about 40% of the schools in the other religious category are uh, conservative Christian schools, evangelical Christian schools. You have some of those in Mexico, I believe. Right? So what's the pattern here? That's a complicated pattern. What do you see here? How about over here for another one of our males here? One of, which, which of you are going to help us? Either language. Maybe the other religions are cheaper. Than, uh, but tell us, the, what do you see? What's the pattern? Uh, the pattern. Um, the first and um, second. Okay. Is the 10 and 15 the stratos are increased? In Espanol, está bien. Ah, bueno, incrementan y el, el estrato más alto es el que decrece. So, our, our, of the other religious schools, we just said non sectarian schools and Catholic schools are increasingly serving children from high-income families. Is, is, it, is it different for the other religious schools? Possiblemente es porque las escuelas privadas de otras religiones son más baratas que las no sectoriales? They are cheaper. They are cheaper, that's right. And But it's really very interesting. Notice the percentage of high income families that chose to send their children to these non-Catholic but religious affiliated schools went down while the percentage of middle income families and low income families that chose to send their children to these other religious schools went up. I mean, it's a very different pattern than these other two, isn't it? It's a real puzzle. And, and your potential explanation was? Thank you. And, and we'll, we'll have more to say about that. Okay, so. So let's just go back. We're, we're near the end. I realize this has been a long time. 
So let's think about what we've done because I think this is relevant to work both that you might do or that you'd want to be able to interpret other people's work. We started with data from a national survey that had information on income, family incomes, and private school choices. Then we did a lot of descriptive work to try and summarize those patterns in a few graphs. And we had this graph, and we had that graph. So that was a big, and that's important in doing policy analysis, is using, figuring out how to summarize complicated information in graphs that are readily accessible. But that's only one of two important steps. The next important step is developing good non-technical, everyday language to be able to explain the patterns that are present in the graphs. So those are key skills that I'm sure you're learning in your coursework here. So I'm very near the end. Let me just move a little on then. So we've seen this. And one thing you see is what happens if you look at cities versus suburbs? And you see the basically affluent families that live in cities. That's on the left. Are much more likely to use private schools. Just, um, maybe we could uh, explain the suburban context in the US to Thank you. So, as we said earlier, if a family has a fair amount of money, and it wants to be sure their child has a high quality education. They can do one of two things. They can send the child to an expensive private school, or they could move to a community that has expensive housing and good public schools. That's true of many, many suburban communities. They have high quality public schools. Almost no large uh, cities in the United States have high quality public schools. So if a family, if an affluent family chooses to live in a city, it's much more likely to send their children to a private school. And here we were doing exactly the same analysis that we did before, but just dividing our sample into families that lived in cities versus families that lived in suburbs. One other pattern is, let me speak that, if we divide it by regions of the country, what you see here is, the big, the big pattern is in the south. Notice how different the south is from the northeast. Very, very different. And this is why you commented on ex expense. Uh, of, it turns out the non-Catholic religious schools are overwhelmingly in the south. That's also where conservative Christian families tend to live. So there are many conservative Christian families that haven't liked trends in public schools. And so they send their children to conservative Christian schools. Unless they're affluent. If they're affluent, they send them to non schools. So if we went to summarize, what are the trends? And then I'm going to suggest a couple of slides of explaining. So what have we shown with all this number crunching? We've seen the so-called 90-50 gaps. That is the gap in private school enrollment rate between high-income families and middle-income families has increased. We saw that. 
We saw that Catholic elementary schools have long-term decline, but increasingly they serve middle-income families because the decline has been much steeper. Excuse me, they serve high-income families because the big decline was in middle-income and lower-income. Okay. We saw that enrollment rates in these non-sectarian, they're the expensive elementary schools, have increased, but the increase is overwhelmingly among affluent families. We know that private school enrollment rates are much higher among families that live in cities than in suburbs. And these gaps between the rich and the affluent in terms of what kind of private, whether they go to private school, much bigger in the South than in other parts. And just, to, just got a couple of slides for them. Why did these happen? What caused these happen? A big part of the trend was that families moved to suburbs. Catholic schools were overwhelmingly located in big cities. When families moved to suburbs, they chose high quality public schools and therefore there was much less of a demand for Catholic school in big cities. The next big story is what happened to the cost of sending a child to a private school. Catholic school tuitions increased fivefold over 40 years. That's net of inflation. So enormous increase in tuitions in all private schools, but particularly among Catholic schools. Why do you think tuitions in Catholic schools increase so much? They have less? Uh, could be. But they have less of something else that's even more important. In 1970, half of the faculties of Catholic elementary schools were nuns, Catholic nuns. And they worked for very little money. So half of them in 1970. In 2010, it's less than 3%. So there's many fewer nuns who work for low cost. If you have to have teachers who are not nuns, you have to pay them much more, hence the big increase in cost. One other thing that has affected Catholic school tuition is, if you look at the, where's the biggest decline, in which part of the country is the biggest decline in Catholic school enrollments? Which part of the country? Northeast. Notice, what's the timing? The big decline is the first decade of this century, right? Huge decline right here. Why do you think that occurred? No reason you should know this. The answer is the sexual abuse crisis, which is concentrated in the Northeast. And you know that this was uh, uh, the revelation that Catholic priests had abused young people. What that did, and how, why did that matter? A, a small reason is because many families didn't want to send their children to private schools. But there's a much bigger reason, and that is the court cases brought by families of children who have been abused were uh, settled by Catholic diocese for tens of millions of dollars. That money used to go to subsidize Catholic school education. It's no longer available because so much money has been spent in, some, in settling these abuse cases. So things that have happened outside have had a big impact. So let me just then, um, this is kind of the concluding slide, I think, yeah. Uh, so basically, 
private schools have become less diverse. They increasingly serve kids from affluent families, especially true in big cities. So in a small way, this is one of the things that's happened that's contributed to poor children increasingly being in schools in which their classmates are other poor children. They, Sean Reardon and I see as a problem for our democracy. But I think the bigger lesson here is, you know, this is this is descriptive research. There's no causality here, but it's it's a way you know, that there are some challenges in taking census data and analyzing in a way that you can see patterns. But if you do it carefully, you can learn an awful lot. And I hope Clay Fowler will take the lead in providing a great deal of rich, important descriptive analyses for the economy in Mexico and perhaps in other member countries as well. So thank you uh, very much for your attention.